Your name is Rose Lalonde. Your cat, Jaspers, is presently floating through the air about ten feet up, on his back as if he is floating in a pool, his cat tail swaying lazily in pleasure. He is happily chatting with one of the trolls, occupied and out of your way. The wands you made from the alchemical combination of knitting needles and a guide to eldritch horror terrors crackle in your palms with black streaks of electricity. Yesterday, you effortlessly took down an ogre with these things, and you ponder what would happen if you really began to exert yourself. Time to find the fuck out. You point your wands down towards the soil of the land of light and rain, a grim smile pulling back your black-painted lips as you unleash a bolt of black lightning into the very ground beneath. Predictably, this results in a wide crater hole about the length of your body, making you stagger back a pace to catch balance. Jasper's high above takes notice, floating further away sheepishly. The wands crackle in your grip. You aren't going to be able to drill down with bursting impacts like this. You'll need a controlled stream of dark magic. You point groundward again and hold your wrists together, wands side by side as you breathe in and try to think drill-like thoughts. While not drill-like, the energy that shoots from the wands is more concentrated now. Instead of a sudden strike, it is sustained and harsh, the dirt in the crater immolated and burnt into nothingness underfoot. Keeping the stream going, you grit your teeth, having to struggle to keep the wands steady. Miss Rose! Jaspers calls urgently from above, having to raise his voice over the sounds of magic. The, the green troll wants to talk to you. Jaspers floats down and hands you the phone, which you grip in your dirt gritty fingers. Hello, Sir Feline. Turn me over to your friend Rose, please. Oh, okay. Sorry, green word troll. Um, no problem. Hello, Kanaya. Jaspers has passed me the phone. I see that you have begun breaking apart your land using wands that you should not even have at your current level. Recklessly pockmarking the ground with implements you barely understand. Let me be frank. This course of action is ill-advised. I was under the impression that you are Kanaya. Beg pardon? You said let me be frank. Did you not tell me that your name is Kanaya? Uh, oh no, I apologize. There is an Alternian saying, let me be frank, which means let me not mince words. Words cannot be minced, Frank. Words are incorporeal concepts which cannot be affected by mincing. Well, um, n no. Okay, I'm starting to realize my culture has a reliance on figurative language. A and it is still Kanaya that did not stop from being my name. What I mean to say is, I want to be clear. Not that I am transparent, but I want a clarity of my words. Words are not clear either. Directness is what I desire. Is that clear? I mean, is that understood? I think so. To recap, you are a transparent verbiage, Chef. Am I being goofed about with? Frankly, yes. I can't talk right now and it's rather easy to spin you in circles. Rose, that makes me angry. Angry is the emotion I feel, and only anger, and I have... No other feelings about that. Whatever you say, but allow me to make one final comment before I blow you off to drill a hole into my planet. Um, okay. <laughs> uh. You hand the phone politely back to your cat. If the green text lady messages me again, please tell her I am busy, Jaspers. You hesitate. But do tell her that it's lovely to speak with her. Um, okay, Jasper's chirps, going back to the skies of Lolar. You wonder what he and the cat troll are talking about that's giving him such a grin. You resume your attempts at drilling. 
These wands make dirt vanish entirely, meaning that the dislocation of soil will not be an issue in your efforts to get into the middle of your planet. So much for the law of conservation of matter. Mathematically speaking, you know that you will reach the center of a sphere if you dig perfectly perpendicular to the sphere's surface, creating a radius with the middle. This, of course, is easier said than done. You need some kind of balance, something to set your wands in to drill a well perfectly perpendicular to the surface of Lolar. You shift your feet in place. That all sounds unreasonably difficult for a magic practitioner. You'll probably have to go back home and search for a measuring tape or a, a level, both of which you're only tenuously sure your mother has. In each fist, you grip your wands tight, concentrating power, a shadowy aura beginning to shimmer around them. A rumbling hum begins to emanate from the wands, and holding them steady takes all of your strength, your biceps burning as you force them steady. Slowly, you move your arms outward, perpendicular to your body, turning the wands until they are facing straight down, pointed at the floor like you're about to stab them downwards into the dirt. Tension builds in your mind as you shut one eye, your heart pounding, wondering if Kanaya was right. Jaspers is watching now, the sky darkening from the amassed eldritch magics. You release the built power, and two beams of yarn-thin darkness shoots from the tips of the wands into the soil in a single instant, leaving the ground seemingly undisturbed. Silence follows. You collapse to your knees, huffing and panting, backing up from the spot on the ground. Did it work? asks Jaspers. You turn to say no to him, but your syllable is cut off by a deafening crunch, the sound of paper tearing amplified by millions of times. In the spot you shot those beams into the ground, two meter-wide holes open, dark energy cascading outward, sending you flying back onto your ass in the pastel grass of Lolar. You groan, tumbling head over heels several feet back from the new holes. You crawl to the newly formed well and look down. You can't see the bottom of the conjoined holes, but they appear to be entirely straight, forming a large binocular-shaped well down into the planet. You drop a nearby pink rock in, watching it vanish into the darkness. No clunk follows. Jaspers? You say, pointing into the hole. Take me down there. Miss Rose? Jaspers peers into the hole doubtfully. Are you sure? Someone told me never, ever dig straight down. Your name is no longer Rose Lalonde. Your name is Diamond Stroog, in the medium of Universe A2. You are the right-hand man of the most notorious criminal in Durse's history. Spades Slick. That makes you, by the chain of command, presently the most notorious criminal in Durse's history. Not that there's much Durse history left to live out. After the death of the Black King, those twelve yahoos on Skya, and the disappearance of your boss, life has been dog water. You've been holed up in a bar that your crew once called its hideout, but at present, it's nothing but an abandoned building with a dwindling supply of liquor. You slug a drink from one of the remaining bottles, crisp and transparent, ever clear. The taste is sharp and smooth, like swallowing a knife. You hiss at the sensation and relax at the imminent warmth pooling in your gut. Boys, you say tipsily, I think this is what they call rock bottom. Yeah, squeaks the small statured club's deuce in agreement. Ugh responds the massively bulky Hearts boxcars. I think we have two courses of action, lads, you say calmly. A metaphorical fork in the road for us. 
The liquor isn't gonna last us forever. Once it runs out, we're gonna have to make a choice. You pass the Everclear to Hearts over Deuce's head. Deuce is drinking chocolate milk. He takes a swig and makes a shudder as if it burnt on the way down. We can sit here and die with the rest of the medium, you say, glancing to both of your buddies. Or go on a suicide mission to try to recover a boss from whatever plane of reality Skya spat him out in. Uh, how do we get into Skya? asks Hearts gruffly. He slides the bottle back to you. You peek behind the counter, but all you see are empty whiskey and bourbon bottles. The last full bottle is an eighth full handle of revolting vodka. You chug the last of it. Ship, you say. The three of you stand, Deuce drinking the last of his chocolate milk. You open the swinging doors to the bar and step out into the cobbled streets of Durs, towards the nearest intermedium ship depot. Around you, Durs is largely deserted. After the Black King's death, most carapaces with a brain between their ears got up and left, either for Skya or one of the Twelve Lands, which you reason aren't that much more hopeful. Everyone knows, Prospidian, Dursite, or Denizen, that once the Black King dies, it's curtains. What's the plan? asks Hearts. You blow air through your cheeks and shrug. We're not royals. We can't open Sky and portals, you reason. The only thing that Sky opens portals for are meteors. You know, stuff flying at it that might hit its surface. What if we zoomed at Sky real fast? offers Clubs. That's stupid, says Hart, slotting his small friend. If we miss, we'll go splat on Skya's surface, right, Droog? You shrug. Hart's groans. You gotta be kidding me. As you walk, something gives you pause, holding a hand out to stop Hart's inducing their tracks. There's a strange, static crackle in the air, some thin and greasy sensation closing in. You look left and right, seeing tiny green sparks at the edges of your vision. Something's coming. Boys! Your three heads shoot upwards as a booming voice sounds overhead. Descending from the dark dursite sky is a figure. Two black wings outstretched, canine ears and snout pointing down at you as the figure descends slowly landing at last before you on the cobbled street. Around its demonic body, green electricity arcs. Boys? The figure repeats in an animalistic voice. You gawk. A look of recognition and triumph are on his face, a look that only barely disguises the figure's manic desperation. Can we help you? You offer the demon. It approaches and its sheer aura freezes you motionless. Can you help me? Listen to this guy! The demon growls, laughing. He extends a hand for you to shake. Mesmerized, you shake it, feeling the same sensation of mild electric shock and the taste of burnt tin you get when licking a battery as a slimeling. Listen, you say, trying to position your body protectively between the demon and your associates. We don't want any trouble. We need to get back to our boss. Your boss? The demon scoffs, holding up a hand. Don't you recognize me? On the hand is a ring, which the demon removes with his teeth. Once it slides off, his canine features vanish, and he becomes a more normal-looking dursite. Behind you, hearts and clubs gasp in recognition. Boss? You say, eyes widening. The man looks exactly like Spade Slick, spare for the scar across his eye, but there's something strange about his voice and his gait. He's the same, but different, in a way that activates some primitive, suspicious part of your brain attuned to spotting the uncanny. It's me, says Spade Slick. It's your boss, Jack Noir. You are no longer Diamond Stroog. Your name is June Egbert. One, two, three, strife. You scream.
scream, feeling the heat from a blast of a nuclear imp sizzle past you and hit a tree to your left. You turn in time to see it burst into sand-sized particles and fall to the ground where the particles themselves split apart into smoke. The worst part of this ordeal is the imp's attitude. They don't seem evil, instead bearing the faces of mean little kids playfully tormenting a bug as they take turns trying to zap you, making giggling squeals as you just barely escape their bolts. Another worst part of the ordeal is Vriska, that fucking alien bitch. She did this. She got their attention. She's the reason you're running for your life. Where's Nana? Where's anyone? There's no one to save you now. Panting frantically, you run chest first into a stone wall, a large brown rock face in the woods. You look left and see it continue, then you look right and see that it stretches that way too. You're backed against a wall, and the imps are closing in. Take a deep breath. The words ring in your ears. Vriska's moronic advice to you before she rang the dinner bell for these imp bastards. The advice has a different tone now as if she's suggesting to take a deep breath and just be at peace with your fate. <laughs> Five imps approach in trees, glowing hands, portents of green lightning to come. John, are you okay? Five years ago, on your 13th birthday, you burnt yourself on the pan in the oven. It was a bad burn, your whole hand covered in red, the smell of burnt skin still etched into your memory. It hurts. You had cried and screamed, clutching your wrist helplessly, stumbling around the kitchen until your father firmly took your shoulders. Breathe. Take a deep breath, son. His words had been so stern they jerked you out of the pain. Four counts in, just like counting on the piano. You and your father breathed in together for four slow counts. Hold it in for four, then blow it all out. The calming breath had made the pain of the burn seem so much less inconsequential. See? All better. Now, you shouldn't put a burn in anything cold. Let's get you some warm water. Your father said this with amusement, and when you looked down at your hand, you saw no burn at all. You'd always assumed you'd imagined the sight of burnt skin. Four counts in. You close your eyes, taking a slow, deep breath. The imps approach, raising their hands. Hold it for four. You hold your breath and feel one, two, three, four, five impacts right on your chest. You open your eyes, still holding your breath, expecting to see triumphant imps celebrating your imminent death. Breathe out! The air in your lungs multiplies and erupts from you like a gale. The five imp blasts completely ineffective against your body, rebounding from you like you're made of rubber. They shoot outward and all hit one imp in the chest, who explodes into atoms just like you had seen the tree do. You're still exhaling, and two more imps fly away, a fourth having to cling to the branch of a tree to remain in place. The wind coming from your lips is gale force, only abating after the fourth imp is blown into the skies like a feather in the intro to a corny historical drama. You pant, out of breath, forcing yourself to breathe evenly. Four counts in, hold it for four. You steady yourself, breathing normally now. You notice your skin is glowing a strange baby blue hue, the same glow as your nana. The one remaining imp is flat on his face some ways away. You collapse against the rock face you'd been backed up into, exhaling exhaustedly. June! A voice rouses you, and Nana flies to your side, grabbing your arms to inspect you for injuries. Nana, did you see? You say, unable to stop yourself from sounding like a proud child who just did a cannonball to impress her dad. I, I did! How did you do that? She laughs, gripping your hands proudly. I don't know, you laugh, hugging her, relieved. I fought back. I can fight back. I'm not useless. Of course you're not, dear. Nana hugs you back and helps you to your feet. 
Uh, my PDA, you say, patting your pockets, realizing there's been a casualty of this battle. Don't worry, dear, Nana says. We can make you a new portable computing doohickey back home. I can't believe I fought five of them and didn't even get a scratch. You start to walk, feeling cocky, flexing your fingers in front of your face. Nothing can scratch an Egbert, Nana insists. Yeah, says the imp. Wait, what imp? You turn on your heel in time to take a green imp blast directly to the face. You are no longer June Egbert. Your name is Equis Zahak. Presently, you are on a meteor in a room with your moirail, Nepeta Leon. There is a sense of seriousness in the air. Seriousness puts you at ease, but seems to make Nepeta fidgety. Stop fidgeting, you say, breaking the silence. Don't be so bossy, she chides, but she does not cease her finger fluttering. Your arms are crossed and your legs parted on the cold metal seat you're positioned in across a table from Nepeta. She brought a cake from some hitherto unknown portion of this meteor, but you don't trust it. Yours sits uneaten as she munches on her third slice. What is your counsel? Will you ask bluntly as Nepeta stops a fork past her lips? You mean about the demon? She clarifies. There is no other matter of import at present, you say simply. The demon is a sole impediment to escaping this place. He is our obstacle. The age-old question of survival rears its head. Fight or flight. Nepeta taps her chin, her narrow-pupiled feline eyes narrowing further as she thinks. I want to say fight, especially when it comes to bark beasts. She slowly thinks through her words. But I also don't think we're going to gain anything from fighting. I agree, you reply. But there is also nothing to be gained from waiting around to simply perish. What do you make of Vriska's idea? You mean her idea to fight the demon head on? Nepeta sucks air through her teeth doubtfully. I don't think that's a good idea at all. All of us together took down the Black King, but I think the demon is stronger. Plus, not everyone is going to want to help fight him. Well reasoned, you say. I find myself agreeing. If the prospect dreamers are to be believed, he made rubble of the yellow moon from orbit. It will be best to wait for our opportunity to flee this medium entirely. You squeeze your arms closer, humming. I shall ask what the high blood thinks, you say, withdrawing a phone with a cracked screen. Equius. Nepeta says in a chiding tone. I don't think he likes talking to you. You're kind of creepy towards him. Nonsense, you scoff. I speak to Sir Makara with respect befitting someone of our stations. You could learn from my example, Midblood. Nepeta rolls her eyes. You put too much stock into Bloodcased, Equius. You should worry about something more real, like romance quadrants. Your eyes roll in turn. Romance is a flight of fancy afforded to the silly and frivolous, you say. Hierarchies of power and status dictate our very lives. You sullenly return to typing on your phone as Nepeta slinks into one of the room's beds with her cake. Sir Makara, I desire your sage wisdom. Sir Makara, I desire your sage wisdom. Sir Makara, I desire your sage wisdom. Sir Makara, I can see you are reading these messages from Trollian Scene Function. Do you ever shut the fuck up? Fascinating. It seems you have adopted a different typing quirk. Are you ready to share your sage wisdom? You don't want my sage wisdom. You creepy-ass Lucis fucking piss drinker! The insinuation that I fuck my Lucis is as insulting as the insinuation that I drink urine. Though, one 
does wonder what the taste would bring. Oft the most taboo liquids bring the most delights. You would know, Sir Makara, from your soper endeavors. Fuck high above the gray planet. Would you ever shut the ever-loving fuck up? Every time you talk, you either get sexual or gross or both. And I'm sick to fucking death of it. We are getting off track, I do believe. I want to know what you think of this demon and what we should do about it. Who cares? He's gonna up and slash us up no matter what. I see. So fighting him is pointless. Should I assume you consider escape? I have asked Nepeta, and she seems to agree. I don't have two cares to rub together on what happens to your creepy ass. I did not realize we were discussing my posterior. I am saddened you do not care about its condition, Sir Makara. Please, stop messaging me. And if I catch you doing that shit again, I'll kill you. You shiver. Death threats from high bloods are so titillating. You look back to Nepeta, who is now dozing on the strange slab-shaped snooze pads that are dotted about the facility in lieu of soper cocoons. You slide into the bed with Nepeta, wrapping one arm around her comfortably. In her half-sleep, she tugs you closer and squirms to get comfy. Moirails often cuddle like this, in a comforting close manner while still remaining platonic, even after arguments and disagreements. Soon you find yourself fading to sleep, the streets of Durse greeting your dreaming vision. You are no longer Equius Zahak. Thank you for listening to Homestuck Alternate Universe. HSAU is sponsored by contributions from viewers like you. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash funkmclovin. This episode was directed, recorded, and edited by Funk McLovin. The cast, in no particular order, A.E. as Terezi, articulately composed as Rose and Mom, Bucky as Carcat, Captain Lazar as Jack Noir, Eclippy as Gamzee and Equius, Janiah as Kanaya and Jade, Pockin as Tavros, Technically Dead as Salix, Harper as Vriska, Shrimp as Nepeta, and West as Feffery. Art by Sunny Dionysus, Gastro, and Clown's Kiss. Supplemental art by Funk McLovin, based on characters by Andrew Hussey. Special thanks to Daft Class, Yoitz Crow, and Andrew Hussey. Homestuck Alternate Universe is not affiliated with What Pumpkin or Viz Media. To read Homestuck's original webcomic, please go to homestuck.com or bambosh.dev slash unofficial dash homestuck dash collection. Thank you.